Welcome in today to Inspire Word here with Catholic Speakers. My name is Taylor Schroll. I am your guest host today. If you uh, were on the stream last night, you would have seen my face, and I am back. I'm happy to be here. Uh, we've got another great guest today, uh, and this is a guest that, I, that I've known for quite some time. Uh, we met back in 2017. His name is Ken O'Gorick. Um, so if you are, are joining the stream, uh, we're glad that you are here. Uh, please post your questions as we're going through uh, any questions that you have for Ken in the comment section. And also, uh, please go to inspireword.com to see the many other conversations and guests, just like the great one we have here tonight. And be sure to sign up for our Catholic Speakers mailing list. Uh, and always click, click the like and subscribe button and follow at Catholic Speakers on social media to receive notifications. Also, before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors for uh, for this series, Solidarity, Solidarity HealthShare, Catholic Order of Foresters, and the pro-life cell phone company Charity Mobile for supporting InspireWord.com and making all this possible. Uh, for information about these amaz amazing organizations, please click the links in the comment section below because jo uh, Joe, our fearless leader, is in the comment section posting these things as we say them. He's a magician, and we're glad that he is here. So uh, without further ado, uh, this isn't about me. This is about our guest tonight. This is about Ken Ogorek. Welcome back, sir. It's nice to see you again. Oh, oh, hold on, Ken. I muted you. Ken, hello. Oh. Try again. <laughs> that, that, that happens to me at home a lot, actually. So uh, <laughs> you know, it's great to be with you, Taylor, and, and everyone who's, who's watching this and will watch it. Uh, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, no, this is great. I I, uh, I mentioned yesterday that I, I, got, I got a list of people that I could possibly uh, be a guest host for, and you were the first name that I saw, and I was like, oh, this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm glad that you're here. Um, so I know you a little bit. We got to meet in 2017. It's funny, as I was preparing for the interview, like like all anytime I do an interview, I like to stalk my guests. So you sent me a lot of stuff, and then I went searching for even more stuff just so that I'm prepared. And But um, the cool thing about you is because I had met you before, I got to search in my computer. I just typed your name, and sure enough, a document from 2017, the John Bosco Conference at, at Franciscan University of Steubenville. Uh, I just happened to go to your session because it was very cleverly named. I knew nothing about you at the time. And uh, it was the the uh, Bill of Rights for Catechesis. I was like, that sounds fun, and I don't have anything better to do. So I went to go to your session, fell in love with you. Uh, you have so much wisdom and and, uh, and leadership within the world of catechesis. So uh, why don't you, I mean, I, that that's what I know about you, and I love and yeah. respect you. But uh, yeah. why don't you introduce yourself uh, here to our audience tonight? Sure. No, it's it's great to be with everybody. Uh, you know, I've I've been blessed for over 20 years to, to work at, at the diocesan level in, in evangelization, discipleship, and catechesis. So, um, you know, uh, I, I don't I don't know what what all ability uh, I have necessarily that God has given me, but I, but I know that he's just given me lots of great opportunities um, to, to serve folks in those ministries. Um, I often say that the reason people like me have jobs at the diocesan level is to help ministry in parishes occur more fruitfully because that's where that's where the faith is lived out so uh you know uh I, i'm an old guy so so mm -hmm. so there's a lot i could tell you about my life i suppose but the bottom line is um i have a day job that i love I, i'm the director of catechesis and evangelization for the archdiocese of indianapolis indiana um and uh as as you experienced in 2017 uh, whenever i have the opportunity i love to get out there uh, speak, leave retreats, do that sort of thing, and 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 so I've been I've been grateful to to Catholic speakers over the years for uh, for collaborating with me in that way. Yeah, so uh, yeah, you are obviously one of the speakers. All the all of the guests on Inspire Word are a speaker for Catholic speakers. You can find all that at CatholicSpeakers.com. But you have you have this job, and a lot of people that that get to travel the country as you do to speak. Well, back whenever that was allowed, uh, you know, the, the caveat that yeah. we'll do it all again soon. Um, and we're booking now, so head on over to the website, and uh, Ken can come to your parish, and he'll prove to you why it would be a good thing uh, throughout our uh, throughout our conversation here. But uh, as the as the director of catechesis, you have a home base, right? A lot of people are like, you know, it's great for a, a traveling person to have this home base. And uh, it, it was it was interesting as I was looking, I didn't realize that you held a, a similar position in the diocese of Pittsburgh. And here's yeah. what was here's what was funny for me. 
I misread it. And it said, I'm going to get the dates wrong, but it was like the spring of the year and then August of another year. And I read it as 1997 to 1997. And I was oh. like, Karen, why I wasn't going to ask you about it. I was like, Karen, why were you there for four months? That looks terrible. And then I realized, oh, no, it was a, I missed the whole decade. You were there yeah. for 10 years and a few months. So yeah. you've been doing this work for a long time. And I think a lot of people who are watching don't know. What is what a diocesan director does? Like you mentioned, you know, a, a kind of an overview. It's like you know, helping people in the parishes. But in your day job, what is it that you, as a as a leader in diocesan ministry, do? Great question. Um, uh, so, you know, every bishop, as as a as one big part of his job description, uh, has has the teaching responsibility to teach himself and to see to it that the faith is taught well. So. So just about every bishop has someone like me to kind of help him, not to teach the faith himself necessarily, but to but to really help orchestrate the teaching of the faith throughout the archdiocese or the diocese, as the case might be. So, so Taylor, the, the main group of people who I work with are the people who run our parish catechetical programs. So a big part of my role with the archdiocese is to is to really support those folks um, really at at essentially at every stage of their of their journey of ministry. So I help pastors hire parish catechetical leaders. Um, I, I help them get off to a good start by making sure they have uh, that they're aware of resources that are available to them and so forth. And then uh, I my my staff and I, we help provide formation for them and support uh, just to help them get better and better at running awesome you know, womb to tomb parish catechetical programs. Um, and then on the evangelization side of the equation, um, I, you know, most parishes have someone like a director of religious education on staff, at least part time. Um, fewer parishes, uh, in my experience, have uh, like an evangelization and discipleship coordinator. That's usually uh, more of an informal kind of volunteer role. Uh, but those folks deserve a lot of help and support and resources as well. So. So we so we work with pastors and parish evangelization team leaders uh, to sort of help them reach the unchurched and the alienated and, and of course, the practicing Catholics as well. Yeah. So when, when uh, most people just go to mass on Sunday, there's so much more going on behind the scenes in the parish. All the people that you like uh, in your parish, Ken has trained all the people you don't like. You need to get Ken to train. <laughs> so uh, so that, that is your like your home base. Uh, but you also travel and you've been tra a traveling speaker for many, many, many years. But recently you've gotten more into retreat ministry and people have been asking you to run retreats. Like, have you seen fruit in that? Are you excited about that? Yeah, it's the darndest thing, Taylor. You know, about a year and a half or to two years ago, um, really kind of out of the blue without me even even um, sort of marketing myself this way, if you will, I, within the space of a few short weeks. I got asked by several folks to facilitate retreats or days of reflection. And, um, you know, on a case by case basis, I kind of, I kind of listened to what people have in mind and, and I said, yes, 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 yes. And wow, it was just such a fruitful time, uh, for me personally, but I really, you know, it, the, the immediate feedback that I got and then just the subsequent, um, sort of back and forth with folks, I, I feel, I feel like, like the, the experience that I was able to sort of um, set up for folks uh, uh, was very helpful to them by God's grace and mercy. So, so even though you know I'm more than happy to come in and just give like kind of a one and done uh, talk, uh, those are those are great on, on certain occasions. But but more and more, gosh, I really love the opportunity to maybe spend a little bit more time with a group of people and and maybe walk them through two or three brief. Um, presentations that kind of that kind of set them up for for an encounter with God. And then, of course, because it's a retreat or a day of reflection, there's actually time. I always build in time for them to put into practice um, some of the some of the things that I'm trying to share with them. So uh, so so anyway, yeah, it's just been um, it was a it was a surprise for me to, to be asked to do that sort of thing. But but I love it. And and I feel like maybe that's an area where where the Lord could make some use of me. Yeah, no, it's, phen it's phenomenal to hear. And like, I come from a youth ministry background. So I've been involved in retreats, like for my parish and that sort of thing. And I think one of the things that I see 
Um, uh, because I, you know, like I'm, I'm similar to you. Uh, you just have more hair. Uh, that's that's really <laughs> that's really the thing. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Mine all fell down this way. So, uh, like on retreats, like you were, like you were just saying, is you can help them actually apply those things, go a little bit deeper, put it into practice. And like I've been asked to come in and give, a, just give a talk, and those are those are cool, those are good. Uh, yeah. But it, but it is those retreats where you get to spend time with people, and like they can just come and naturally ask you questions. Like you're sitting at lunch, and people just come and sit with you, and you're. Like, it's one of those things, Ken, you're one of the most um, attractive in the sense of like, you, people are attracted to you. Like, I, I don't, I'm not trying to be weird. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like it's, a, it's the dad jokes. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So like, I mean, like you live in Indianapolis and I was at a conference and there's, there's like literally over 20,000 people at this conference, Ken. And I, I'm loud. So people can usually hear me from across the place. You're, you're not, you're just hanging out. You're just doing your own thing. I just sensed you. Like you're just such a joyous person. I saw you and I just go, Ken, you know, like, and so I would imagine that people just enjoy being at a retreat with you um, to be able to not, not only hear you, hear your, you know, your, your speaking chops and all the things that you've been able to, to, to hone throughout the years, but also just to be with you. Well, no, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I think, I think that joy is really important and we all show it in different ways, you know, different personality types and temperaments and what have you. But, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, I love, I love Chesterton's line before he actually entered full communion. I apparently one of his friends said, Gilbert, you know, GK Chesterton, you sound pretty Catholic. Why don't you just, you know, make that leap and become Catholic? He said, Oh, it's not Catholicism that I have any issues with. It's Catholics. They're so dour and, and you know, they're so somber. Why would anybody want to join up with a group like that? You know, so so I, I think the joy of, of, of living in a disciple relationship with Jesus is it's helpful to do that. And, uh, you know, Taylor, I was just thinking, it's kind of, you know, Catholics are sort of funny in a lot of ways. And with retreats, I think we're sort of funny sometimes because it's it's sort of like when kids are, are being prepared for confirmation, we're sort of like, kids, guess what? This is a very special time in, in your life. And we're going to do this thing. It's called a retreat. You know, um, it's almost like it's almost like you we're, we're saying, you know, you're only allowed three retreats in your whole life. You know, there's right. something we're going to do one now when, you know, you and I both know that really every Catholic, I would say every Catholic once a year, at least ought to take at least a morning or an afternoon or an evening just to kind of take stock of, of how the spirit is, 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 is working and moving in her, his life. So, uh, so, you know, we've done retreats with young folks certainly over the years, but gosh, doesn't, doesn't every parishioner, uh, deserve a decent um, retreat or renewal opportunity every year, you know? Yeah, no, I, I love that encouragement and that challenge because, uh, yeah, I, th I think I, at uh, where I used to work, it was encouraged like in most parishes too. It's encouraged that everybody that works on, on the parish staff and the ministry staff to take one retreat a year just to kind of get away. And that's always one of my favorite times of the year, just to kind of slow down, reassess, you know, be poured into uh, with the word of God and, 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 and spend some extra time in prayer. Uh, so what are the, what are the, like the topics that you love, especially on retreats? Like what, are, what, are, what is the main topic or the string of topics that you really love to help people dive into their relationship with Christ? Um, I, I, um, gosh, who was it that said, uh, most people don't need to be taught so much as we need to be reminded. We need to be yeah. reminded. So I like to spend a little time just reminding people First of all, that, you know, um, the way that we reach out to God in prayer is in many ways similar to the ways that we reach out to any person who we love. You know, um, you know, I compliment my wife uh, in a sense, praising God is complimenting him. You know, I, I express gratitude to to my children. Uh, that's what prayers of Thanksgiving are. So I like to I like to do a little thing where. Um, I kind of start with asking people to imagine themselves in different scenarios with, with a loved one. And, and I kind of help them see how, you know, prayer doesn't have to be super complicated in terms of our outreach to God. Um, so that's something I like to do. And then I love to sort of remind people um, that God is constantly reaching out to us. He's constantly trying to communicate himself to us, to guide our thoughts uh, and feelings 
And so I kind of walk through some of the major ways that he does that. And you mentioned one earlier. Well, actually, I believe you said the word of God. And, and one of the things I point out to people that, that alongside sacred scripture, um, uh, as Catholics, we know that both sacred scripture and sacred tradition together comprise the one word of God. So I like to talk a little bit about, you know, it's good to reflect on the teaching of the church uh, uh, on a regular basis. And oftentimes in a similar way, you know how when you're reflecting on a passage of scripture and it seems to hit you between the eyes and address a current situation that you're dealing with. I've had that experience many times, you know, in my daily reflection, just on just on the teaching of the church. So so just kind of reminding people about all those ways that God is reaching out to us. And then again, as we said earlier, giving people a time, then giving people time to work uh, or just to spend some time with that, you know, um, reaching out to God, listening to God. And, and what I what I hope happens after the retreats that I facilitate is I, I feel like I want to equip people sort of to move forward uh, in a, maybe a maybe a deeper way or a way that they just needed to be reminded about. Yeah, I love the reminder thing. Like every time that I've attended a retreat. I, I very rarely learn new things at retreats because they're yeah. not supposed to, they're not primarily catechetical. It is let's, let's, let's be reminded. Like uh, I, I get reminded a lot, you know, like the love is patient, love is kind thing. Like you can yeah. hear that in mass and just be like, Oh, I've heard that before. But then you hear it at a retreat and it's like, well, if I'm supposed to be loving, am I patient? No. Am I yeah. kind? Not all the time. And then it's just kind of a, the, to be able to find that challenge in there. So if you want to book Ken uh, to come to a retreat uh, this fall, this spring, whenever your parishes are beginning to open again, you can you can find his profile on catholicspeakers.com. And also, uh, as we continue this conversation, uh, leave comments as Amy did. We're going to get to her comment here or her question here in just a second. Um, but if you have any questions for Ken, feel free to type those into the chat. So I would imagine you have you have spoken about this at length before, Ken. But Amy asks, I teach Sunday school. Any advice to Sunday school teachers that you would like to that you would like to see that is important to you? So any advice for Sunday school teachers, the the great people volunteering on Sunday mornings? Well, um, one thought that comes to mind is is something that uh, Saint uh, Pope Saint Paul the Sixth said. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but that pe people of today don't listen to teachers so much as they listen to witnesses. And if they listen to a teacher, it's probably because the teacher is also a witness. So I think Sunday school teachers, catechists, they need to understand that in addition to conveying information, which is really, really important, they need to, to share something of the power and beauty of that teaching in their life or the life of someone they know. Maybe maybe a, a parishioner who who their students might know, maybe a saint. So so I would say teaching and witnessing. Um, and the other thing I always like to tell catechists is, you know, we we've all had that experience of putting a lesson together. And man, at 11 p.m. at your dining room table, it just sounded awesome. But then you try to do it uh, with 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 a group. And it, it just crashes and burns, you know, it's a disaster. It's a train wreck, you know, you know, we, we've all had that happen. But I always, I want catechists to know that even on those days, never underestimate the impact that you're having on those kids by God's grace and mercy. You know, they, they, they're not stupid. They, even, even when your lesson bombs, they know that you love them enough to prepare something. Um, and, and just your, just the act of trying to teach them. And, and witnessing to the importance of what you're teaching them, that has an impact on them. So I never, I never want catechists to kind of lose their, lose their confidence. We all have days like that, but you're still having an impact, a positive impact on those kids by God's grace and mercy. Yeah, I just heard a story the other day. It was about, it was about a teacher. And uh, all uh, all these kids they interviewed her years later, all these kids grew up like in the worst part of Baltimore, like in the, in the slums. And there was a test done on them. And everybody that, that did it like a, uh, sociology test on him said that they were going to be failures in life. And then, so somebody else picked up the study 30 years later, went and interviewed them. And uh, almost every single one of them, like almost 190 of the 200 were successful businessmen and lawyers wow. and all of the, and uh, doctors and all these things. And they, they asked these people why, and they said, well, we had this one teacher. So they went and found the teacher and she was like, what did you do that was so special? What did you tell them? What did you teach them? She said, I, I loved them. Like that, that was it, right? Like, so like you're saying as a catechist, as a Sunday school teacher, as anybody doing ministry, uh, uh, ministry proper in the church or just ministering to your family and your kids yeah. and, and those around you, 
It doesn't have to be perfect. We're going to mess up. We're going to say the wrong thing. We're going to do the wrong thing. We're going to be unclear. We're going to bomb it sometimes, uh, unless you're Ken, obviously. But you know, but uh, but just loving people, reminding you know, sharing Jesus with them is what they're going to uh, remember there. And and it's it's just, it's interesting that Amy asked this question because you're starting to talk about leadership within the church, leadership. Uh, as a volunteer, leadership, obviously, you know, you're a leader uh, in the diocesan level, helping leaders in the parish level, and you've done a lot of this leadership coaching, this leadership training. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what that is and your role in it? Yeah, so, you know, um, it was about five years ago, um, my old friend Keith Borchers, who's worked for for a, a couple of three different dioceses over the years, um, he approached me because he was starting his own leadership consulting firm that that would work only with Catholic leadership teams, meaning bishops in their cabinets, pastors and their staffs, um, school leaders and their and their their admin teams, um, and and just to, to to make a long story short, um, uh, it might have been the summer of 2017. I'm trying to remember if it was that same summer, but um, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops a few summers ago they had this huge convocation of Catholic leaders. Um, in Orlando, Florida, and one of the closing keynoters was a was a a great guy named Patrick Lencioni. Some some of you might be familiar with Patrick Lencioni, but 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 the main point, one of the main points of his talk was that um, there's this thing called organizational health, and I don't have time to get into the details of it now. But but you know, Patrick's assertion was that the organizational health of Catholic leadership teams is one of the keys to to advancing missionary discipleship in the USA, you know, in the, in the decades ahead. And, uh, so, so basically the consulting that I do, the training that I do, it's, it's with the Evangelium Consulting Group. Um, and, and folks can, folks can reach me through, uh, through Catholic speakers regarding that sort of work as well. Um, we, we work with leadership teams, uh, helping them to, to be more organizationally healthy. And, and again, that has to do with just working together more effectively and fruitfully uh and also such that doing ministry is more joyful and life-giving and not not a gut-wrenching stress fest because taylor you know you and i know plenty of people in ministry and they might like the ministry tasks that they do but unfortunately um quite a few folks that i know in ministry are are kind of stressed out and maybe even burnt out and a lot of it has to do with some of those those politics and and the emotional turmoil that can be present on on the staff itself, you know, on the leadership team. So, so we kind of work in that area, and it, and it dovetails nicely sometimes into retreat work, like staff retreats. So I can kind of combine spirituality with some of these just more practical, virtue based concepts, and really help that team grow spiritually, but also work together better. Yeah, no, that that's tremendous, and like it's one of those things. Like I've I've worked in parishes that desperately could have could have used that and just didn't have it, you know? So yeah. um, I, I think that's one thing that a lot of people like, you know, I have worked in a church and now I don't work within the church, but I, I, I think that a lot of people just sit in the pews don't understand. It's like how stressful this can be and how like a lot of our, our, our pastors, God love them. They are trained and well-equipped to share, to share the gospel and to, and to se uh, celebrate the sacraments. Well, but when it comes to leading a large business, you know, it's a nonprofit organization, but like leading people and, and money and all these things, they're not trained in that. So I think the, the leadership training that you guys can do uh, can be really special. And speaking of, of new leadership, Candy has asked a question. So we're going to go back to the comments here. Candy says, my boyfriend and I have been ahead of all religion, which is exciting and nerve wracking at the same time. Totally understand that. We were kind of left in the dark from the previous team. Uh, so we are really starting a whole new program. Uh, Ken, what would, would what would be your advice for a good starting point for essentially rebuilding this religious education ministry? And, and would there be any uh, key resources for that? Kind of starting from scratch. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, couple, wow is right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, well, it's funny. In some ways, there's nothing more liberating than starting with just like a, a pen and, you know, starting something from scratch. But so one thought that comes to mind is is avoiding extremes. Um, sometimes when we start something new, um, uh, we we want to try. We might want to try and replicate or imitate too closely what was happening before us. Um, 
or we might we might swing the opposite way and you know say i don't know what we're going to do but it's going to be the complete opposite of what was going on before us you know right, so right. so i think that virtue you know those cardinal virtues come in handy in, in, in all areas of life but certainly that virtue of temperance um maybe trying not to completely transform everything about the program um that first year uh you, you know take stock of what was going well um don't and don't take it for granted you know figure out why it was going well and try to maintain that and then and then just um you know uh put your stamp on it i would say over the course of two or three years i like um I like to do something, uh, I didn't invent this, but it's, it's called a KQS survey. And it might be a good idea to do just a quick informal survey of some of the stakeholders uh, candy in the program. And it's, it's basically what should we keep doing? What should we quit doing? What should we start doing? So, so just try to get some affirmation of things that, that, are, that were going well. It's nice to, to have some positive. And, and maybe there are some things that, that people would like the program to quit doing and then maybe there are some things that people would like the program to start doing so that i mean those are some things that come to my mind as a good basis for for for, for starting the program not entirely from scratch but really maybe doing a, a pretty substantial renovation yeah no that's great ken um and we're coming down to the close of our time and my last question actually fits with with uh, our last question here in the comments from tom uh, he's asking where do i get more info on your strategy ken i know that uh, you have been doing this long enough that you have put a lot of your strategy down onto paper that you, you have been an author before and you're working on a new project as well. Um, so uh, where, like, I'm, I'm guessing your book is a good answer to Tom's question in some of your writings. Well, you know, as far as my approach to a lot of the ministry uh, experience that the experiences that I try to provide. Yeah. I, I, I have a, I have a book that just went out of print. So I'm working on a second edition of it. Uh, uh, but but I did write an adult catechism, a lectionary based adult catechism called the Gospel Truth. So that can still be found uh, out there on the internet, you know. Or, or Tom, I, I always say I'm not in the Catholic Witness Protection Program. I'm, I'm easy to find. So you can reach out to me through the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. Um, uh, if you want some information on the um, on the leadership training and consulting, um, it's it, the 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 group is called the the Evangelium Consulting Group. So Evangelium. A consulting group uh, that can give you some basic info on our approach. Uh, and again, my my work uh, in that regard can be can be facilitated through Catholic speakers for sure. Awesome, awesome. Well, Ken, this is great to talk to you again. I've I've enjoyed. We got to talk on the phone a little bit earlier today. Uh, I, I just I've I've enjoyed it a lot, and I know that that, that we've seen everybody say thank you uh, to to all of your sharing. Um, so. Anything in closing, your final, final, you get, you get 30 seconds to just give us your final bit of wisdom. What you got for us? Well, you know, I learned a long time ago that all change is stressful, even positive change. And I think, I think it's been a, a change filled year for people to say the lit, the least. So, so as, as we forge ahead by God's grace and mercy, um, whatever changes come your way, even those positive changes, just be good to yourself, you know, be mindful, be mindful that, that, that all change can be a little bit stressful. And just stay close to the Holy Spirit and 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 be good to yourself and and you know because God is good uh, and He wants us to be good to ourselves in that regard. So so just uh, yeah, take care of yourselves, people. Take care of yourselves. I love that, Ken. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. I appreciate it. You bet. I'm sure our paths will cross again, Taylor. Oh, definitely. I can't wait. I can't wait. Bye -bye. All right. Bye, buddy. All right. Well, that that is our our inspired word for this evening. I want to thank all of you for joining us there in the comments, especially um, all, all of you guys, Jane, Tom, Candy, Amy, everybody who asked questions and, and was active here with us. I appreciate it. Um, please go to inspireword.com to see our many other conversations and guests just like this one. And be sure to sign up for the mailing list. You can find Catholic Speakers on social media at Catholic Speakers. Um, and if you're interested in booking Ken uh, for an event, for his training, for a retreat, for any any speaking engagement, please go to catholicspeakers.com or email us at info at catholicspeakers.com. My name is Taylor Schroll, and I've enjoyed uh, guest hosting this. You can find more from me at fortecatholic.com, F-O-R-T-E Catholic. Uh, and coming up tomorrow, let's see. I, I don't know if – oh, I'm, I'm soloing. What did I do here? Let's hide this and show – this 
Here we go. I'm figuring it out. There we go. So uh, tomorrow, same place, same time, uh, different guest host. You're welcome for that. <laughs> and uh, Lauren's going to be our guest tomorrow night. So please stay tuned to that. God bless you guys and have a good rest of your evening. Peace.